pavialay.it Accende il tuo territorio. Important seminars for doctors and pharmacists and students who want to look the future of clinical pharmacy. Anchoring the past makes no sense if the future makes work easier and cheaper, more effective and more efficient. It's very important to learn to work in an efficient team, particularly in specialistic wards, such as internal medicine and geriatrics wards and emergency departments, organized by Prof. Simona Collina, Dean of Pharmacy and CTF Courses, Prof. Giovanni Ricevuti, Teacher of Clinical Pharmacy at University of Pavia, with the collaboration of Department of Drug Science, School of Pharmacy, University of Pavia, Erasmus Office of School of Pharmacy, Conferenza Permanente dei Direttori delle Scuole di Medicina di Emergenza ed Urgenza, Conferenza Permanente dei Direttori delle Scuole di Specialità in Farmacia Ospedaliera, PhD in Biomedical Sciences, Harvey School of Medicine, University of Pavia, Master in Crisis Management in Healthcare, Emergency Medicine. Italian Society of Clinical Pharmacy. We will discuss the nuances of the modified approach to take with seniors and lead into the discussion of polypharmacy, geriatric syndromes and problems among geriatric patients in the ED. moment we are we are ready now to start uh, our important session uh, qui c'è una cosa da togliere uh, attiva ha ah, già condiviso ok uh, Allora, chissà se è andata già via, ha condiviso, ha condiviso, ha già condiviso? No. Ok, allora, se viene qui condiviso. Sì. Ok, we are ready to start this important session with two important, 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 but this is true. Uh, colleagues from USA. One is uh, one is uh, Jenny. Professor uh, Jennifer uh, Cole from uh, Harvard University and Massachusetts General Hospital, and the other is uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, okay, Lexi Asrov from uh, University Hospital of Chicago. It's okay. One is a doctor. Another is a pharmacist. Why? Why is uh, now we will uh, uh, define what uh, uh, what um, we, we will define today uh, with the uh, lectures uh, of uh, uh, Jenny and Lexi um, about these uh, new activities for Italy, not new for USA, not new for other countries, not for many important many many countries of Europe we in Italy we are starting to develop this aspect that is connected with clinical pharmacy and we will try to understand and to learn more about clinical pharmacy this is your future your future related to students of pharmacy and students of, ph of medicine also because the future is to work together in a team in a hospital in all wards and also in the country pharmacist and gp in the country pharmacist and other doctors and nurses in the hospital now I'm very indebted to Jenny for uh, 
uh, is uh, support, uh, uh, support for, to our activity and uh, for coming to Pavia from uh, Harvard, uh, yes, and also to Lexi to be today in connection with uh, Jenny to discuss uh, in, uh, uh, in the other um, way uh, the role of the connection with the pharmacist. Um, I'm happy because we, for these activities, we had uh, many supports from uh, um, societies, scientific societies, from uh, doctors, hospitals, and from our university. Uh, please, um, Jenny, Thank can you. you introduce yourself and uh, your lecture? Hi, hello everyone. Um, it's very nice to meet you. So like Giovanni said, my name is Jenny Kale and I am a clinical pharmacist. Um, then I do specialize in emergency medicine. Um, I won't go into kind of the background about how you become a clinical pharmacist or how you specialize in emergency medicine because I will be talking about that tomorrow in our special kind of pharmacy related talk. So please Feel free to come join or listen in if you are free tomorrow for those talks. There's the first one on emergency medicine, clinical pharmacy, and then the second one just on general clinical pharmacy. Um, but today I'll essentially be kind of talking about how I would educate our physicians on treating different conditions within the geriatric population, because we do know that they have many differences in kind of how they metabolize medications, how they react to different medications, and so we'll be going through that with different disease states that are most common presentations. Um, and this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, my dad is actually turning 90 years old next month, um, so we talk a lot about his health, and as the population ages, we see a lot more geriatric patients coming to our emergency department. Um, I have nothing to disclose for this presentation. Um, so what we'll be doing today is explaining the differences in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in the elderly. Now I know these are really pharmacy specific words, but essentially what pharmacokinetics is, is how our body metabolizes the medication. So what our body does to the drug and pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to our body. And these, these are all uh, very different in our elderly population and we'll talk about why that matters. So, and then we'll describe first line agents to treat agitation, pain, and urinary tract infections in these populations, as these are a lot of the common presentations to the emergency department. And then we'll identify what drugs are associated with the uh, less adverse events and compare time to therapeutic onset between different agents, as this does differ in our geriatric population. And I do want this to be a very interactive discussion. I not only want to teach you about my practice, but I would love to hear about your practice as well. So feel free to interrupt me. This is quite informal. Um, so when we talk about pharmacodynamic differences in the elderly, so again, this is what the drug does to our body. So when we think about using benzodiazepines, and this is typically um, in today's lecture, we'll be discussing when we're treating agitation, so there's increased sensitivity to the benzodiazepines because the GABA receptor where the benzodiazepines bind in the body, it actually changes in structure, composition, and function. And so your GABA receptors are more sensitive to the drug binding. And so our elderly patients will have more effect from the same strength of benzodiazepine that we give them. And so we need to decrease the dose. And then when we're talking again about antipsychotics with our agitation, there's the age-related um, decreases in the dopamine in our central nervous system. And so the dopamine antagonism, so the blocking of the dopamine receptor by our antipsychotics has more effect on those movement disorders uh, that we can sometimes see with our antipsychotic agents. So again, we need to decrease the dose and potentially avoid antipsychotics so that we don't have those unwanted movement disorders. So then moving on to the pharmacokinetics. So again, this is what our body does to the drug. 
So when we think about pharmacokinetics, we think about drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So in our elderly patients, they have increased gastric pH, so their stomach is more alkalotic. And in a lot of our medications, that decreases the absorption of the medication. So you would think that maybe the patient gets less of the medication because it's less dissolved. However, elderly patients also have decreased motility. And so the drug has longer in the GI tract to absorb. So it's kind of a toss up whether or not the drug has increased or decreased absorption. It really depends on where in the GI tract the medication is absorbed. Um, and if you're curious, you can definitely ask your friendly pharmacist. Um, and then we think about distribution. So how much does the drug distribute into the body? So in our elderly patients, they have increased total body fat because they have decreased muscle mass. So when we think about our lipophilic drugs, so these are drugs that love distributing into the fat, we have more of that distribution so the elderly patients see more of that drug. And again, we think about this with our benzodiazepines, like our lorazepam, our midazolam, and so again, our elderly patients are more sensitive to these medications. And then when we think about metabolism, so a lot of our medications are metabolized by the liver um, with our CYP enzymes. And so when you age, your hepatocytes or your hepatic mass actually decreases and the blood flow to the liver decreases. And so you get less metabolism of your medications, uh, what we call first pass metabolism. And so what you might actually see a higher concentration of the active drugs in the body again, making our elderly patients more sensitive. And then many of our medications are eliminated through the kidneys. And just like our liver, our kidneys have less nephrons and get less blood flow, and so there's less elimination from the kidneys, and so you have more of the drug accumulating in the body as you age. All right, so how many of you have treated an agitated patient who is 65 years or older? And how did that go? Did that go well? Was the treatment effective? Kind of, sort of. <laughs> I've never heard anyone say, yes, it worked great. Um, usually treating agitation is, is tricky um, and sometimes doesn't work with the first medication. So today I'll break up our agitation talk into kind of two components. So the first, obviously being a pharmacist, my focus and my love is on how to treat the disease state. However, I think agitation is one of the clinical conditions where actually the assessment, evaluation, and kind of your diagnosis is incredibly, incredibly important in the treatment because we really want to focus our treatment on the main cause of why the patient is agitated. So we'll be discussing both. So when we think of reasons why a patient might be agitated, um, two of the primary underlying causes are delirium and psychosis. So when we think about psychosis, uh, we usually have either functional psychosis or stimulant-induced psychosis, so due to a drug. And in patients with psychosis, they typically have an intact sensorium and hallucin hallucinations are usually auditory, versus when a patient is delirious, either due to metabolic derangements, maybe their electrolytes are off, or it could be drug-induced. A lot of our elderly patients are on a lot of medications, polypharmacy, so they could be delirious due to that. They usually have an altered sensorium. They don't really know where they are, potentially who they are, and their hallucinations are usually visual um, and less auditory. So these can be some kind of factors that help you differentiate uh, what the underlying reason for the agitation. And in our elderly patients, when we think about delirium, now we know delirium really happens on a spectrum from hypoactive, when the patient might be less conversive, they might be less interactive, um, oftentimes this is frequently missed in this population because we just think that maybe they're tired or they're just not interactive at baseline um, to hyperactive, which is that very agitated state. But we do have to remember that when we think about delirium, about 65% of our delirious patients are actually in the hypoactive state. Um, so we also want to make note of that. And we, do you guys use the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale when you think of um, kind of behaviors when we think of like someone who might be agitated. No. 
Um, sometimes we use this in the United States, and so the um, acutely agitated patient would be like the plus three or four, where they're very agitated, they might be combative, things of that sort, so on this side of the spectrum. Delirium, uh, as we know, is very common in our elderly patients. The statistics say it, it occurs in about 8 to 17 percent of our elderly patients, and of the patients who come from nursing homes to the emergency department, about 40 percent of them um, could be delirious, um, so almost half of our nursing home patients. And the overall occurrence of delirium on our internal medicine units is about half of those patients. Um, so prompt diagnosis is very important. As we know, the further and longer we don't diagnose it, the more uh, mortality we have. So always something to watch out for in our geriatric patients. And what we're really going to focus on today um, that we potentially need pharmacologic treatment for is that hyperactive delirium, that they're disoriented, they could be very aggressive with their words and actions, and they, it might be due to a life-threatening condition. So we really need to manage it quickly so that we can appropriately perform our um, clinical evaluation and assessment. Um, and this leads us to our acute agitation, which is that emergent situation that really breaks the therapeutic bond between the patient and the provider and does require immediate intervention to ensure safety for both the patient and the care team. And I will say this is a kind of a tough topic to teach because there really is minimal literature discussing the most appropriate treatment of agitation in our geriatric population. And most of the recommendations are really just um, based on expert consensus of uh, providers in the field. So there's not great guidelines, and so um, that's why I think it's a very important topic to kind of uh, digest and take apart. And it's also very important that we treat it um, promptly because there's a lot of clinical sequelae that can happen to your patient if they remain very aggressive and agitated for uh, an increased period of time. They could become um, hypovolemic because they're likely not drinking anything. They might be sweating, having their insensible losses. In addition to that, electrolyte uh, disturbances because their muscles are um, flexing, they might have rhabdomyolysis. That increased uh, CK can lead to acute kidney injury. So a lot of things can happen to our elderly patients if we don't um, calm them down in a quick manner. So do you feel confident that you would be able to differentiate between delirium and psychosis in your patients? And what might you use to help differentiate these two? I think it's the, it uh, depends um, on the patient, uh, on how he, he is, no? So how, he, how he's presenting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's very important. Also, potentially past medication history, if you can see if it's potentially drug-induced. Um, maybe they've been in the hospital for a while and you think it's more likely delirium versus psychosis. Um, do they have a history of psychiatric illness that might lead to more of the um, untreated illness and potentially psychosis, um, things of that sort. So we can ask them uh, mm -hmm. the history, uh, um, the pharmacologist history? Uh, potentially. So if your patient is able to have a um, conversation with you, I definitely ask the patient. Mm -hmm. If maybe there is a family member present, you could ask them if this has potentially happened before, if they've noticed this occurring over a prolonged period of time, then it might lead to more of the delirious state. Um, also asking the nurse. The nurse is obviously at bedside um, most of the time and the one that might know the patient best. You could definitely ask the nurse kind of how this initially presented. Was it maybe due to a new medication that was added? Um, so yes, definitely asking those clarifying questions either to the patient, a family member, or someone who has been with the patient um, for a prolonged period of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and do you guys, uh, commonly or um, providers that you've seen frequently assess for delirium in the emergency department? No. 
I had just one case um, in uh, Red Cross, and um, but he was uh, in in toxic in uh, toxicity. Intoxicated mm -hmm. because because of um, his farm farm chain um, medications. Uh, he had um, uh, a, a wrong uh, medic medication. A long medication list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he had an, um, uh, this kind of agitation and uh, delirium, be uh, uh, even because he um, uh, thought that he uh, is going to die, just because he, he took a, a, a wrong um, medicine. Uh, I see. So he became agitated after he heard that news. Yes. Um, at my hospital, we didn't assess for delirium either in the emergency department until recently, um, but it has now become a part of our nursing assessment when patients come to the emergency department. Um, so that's also something to consider is adding it just into your initial assessment questions, depending, there's many different um, sort of tests you can do. There's the CAM agitation assessment, that one is pretty long. Um, there's also shorter kind of orientation questions that you can ask them, but um, very important to consider always asking um, patients in the geriatric age range. Um, when we think about different causes of agitation, um, we talked about delirium, psychosis. Um, as, as your colleague just mentioned, it could be due to um, toxicity from different medications. It could be due to an underlying psychiatric illness. Um, pain. So our geriatric population often presents with painful conditions differently than other patients. Sometimes they're not able to verbalize that they're in pain and so they can present just agitated and you kind of have to dig out that potentially they are in pain. It could be medication induced um, or an underlying clinical condition. So when you think of what intoxication it might be from, we think of our stimulants, so cocaine, methamphetamine, um, LSD, different stimulants like that. Underlying psychiatric illness could be bipolar, um, PTSD, depressive disorder. Uh, medical, medic, sorry, medication induced, we often think of our sedative hypnotics, narcotics. Um, if patients take too many histamine blockers, they can become agitated. Um, but we also must remember that patients can be very agitated due to medication withdrawal or substance withdrawal. So oftentimes patients with alcohol withdrawal will present very agitated um, or benzodiazepine withdrawal, things of that sort. And then underlying medical conditions. So this is um, sort of a broad diagnostic workup that I think sort of encompasses most of the clinical reasons if it is due to an underlying medical condition and you would catch with um, ordering these laboratories. So if a patient is hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic, they might present agitated. Um, if they are infected, um, again, if they have electrolyte abnormalities, um, if they have liver failure, they might be in encephalopathic from their high ammonia levels. Um, if they are hypothyroid or hypo hyperthyroid, um, evaluate for ingestions. So doing your tox screen is also important. And then also getting imaging. So if they are altered, you might think about potentially an intracranial hemorrhage. So is there a bleed? Um, are they having an ischemic stroke? So they're not getting oxygen to their brain. So getting um, the necessary imaging is also very important. All right, so that's the diagnost the kind of assessment diagnostic side of this lecture. Any questions that I can answer about that? And of course, Lexi being the provider um, can also <laughs> very much answer diagnostic questions. Um, not independently. So um, I can kind of describe to you what my work situation looks like. Um, so I sit in, we have, Mass General is broken up into different sort of pods based on acuity in the emergency department. So the most acute section or critically ill patients go to what we call acute. And so the way that the desks are set up is the providers sit this way, the physicians 
assistants sit that way, and then we sit right next to them with um, the respiratory therapists and our trauma team. And so we sit out in the open with the providers. And so whenever patients come to the acute section, we go with the physicians to meet the patients, to listen to their stories, and we remain at bedside and talk about the different um, potential diagnoses and what we would treat them with. Um, so we don't actually put in the imaging or the laboratories into the computer, but we do look at them when they result and um, are involved in the discussion and treatment of the patient. All right, moving on to my favorite. Um, so when we think about treating agitation, um, there was this sort of movement um, in beta, Project Beta published in 2012, and this has really been the cornerstone of how we think about treating um, agitation, not just in our geriatric patients, but in our patients overall. And uh, these are kind of their four main pillars, is that pharmacotherapy should be our second line. We should always think about using our non-pharmacologic measures first, so our different distraction, um, practices, uh, creating a calm environment for our patients before reaching to our pharmacologic agents, um, to use to minimize physical restraints and seclusion, um, and then most of the patients um, should get a psychiatric evaluation just to rule out any underlying psychiatric condition. So Project Beta is, is very important when we talk about uh, our treatment. And treating agitation in the elderly um, is unique because they do have an increased baseline incidence of medical illnesses. A lot of them are on a lot of medications that we have to consider when we talk about drug-drug interactions. Um, like we talked about, they have physiologic and pharmacologic differences, so we have to consider what dosages and how they will react to their medications. And they are more vulnerable to the side effects because, like we said, they typically have um, they're more sensitive to the medications that we give. So we typically have to use lower doses and slower titration when we give additional medications. So again, uh, medications should be second line. I know sometimes these situations are very high stress and medications kind of help to calm you down, but typically the medications that we give don't actually treat the underlying condition and that's what we should be focused on evaluating. However, in the situations where your safety, the patient's safety is at, is at risk or you're not able to complete your medical assessment, this is really when we reach toward our medications. And the therapeutic goal for our medications should just be to calm the patient to the point that you're able to complete um, whatever is medically necessary, not to over sedate the patient. Um, over sedation obviously leads to more side effects. It leads to increased length of stay for the patient. So it's really just to calm, calm the patient. So the general principles when we're treating agitation is uh, again to guide the medication based on the most likely cause. Um, administer the medication with the lowest risk for side effects and drug interactions based on what your patient is taking. Using the, uh, the oral route as much as you can. I know a lot of patients we do have to use intramuscular or intravenous, but if, a pa if the patient is agreeable to taking medication orally, this is the best because it does have a longer duration of action um, than the other routes, and so you typically have to give less medication. Allowing time for therapeutic effect is very, very important, and I'll show you a slide um, later on in the presentation that kind of goes through how long it takes medications to actually show their clinical effect, and it is much longer than you think it is. So being calm and waiting for the effect is very important. And then avoid um, combining medications that have similar side effect profiles, which we will talk about. So the first class of medications is our first generation antipsychotics. And the way that these work is they block the, the dopamine 2 receptor in the brain. Um, and the, the most um, effective medications in this class are the high potency agents, including haloperidol and droperidol. Now I know in the US, droperidol was off, um, off limits for a while due to the QTC prolongation concern. However, um, it is now coming back and we're using it more frequently. Do you guys use droperidol here? No. Do you use haloperidol here? Yes. Is it due to the QTC prolongation? Yes. Well, hopefully in the future it will come back. Um, 
more recent studies have shown that the QT prolongation concern is um, likely over exaggerated, um, but at Mass General we do um, if able to get an EKG before administration, we do uh, require that per our policy. One thing to consider with these agents is that we want to avoid them in patients who have Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia because those patients already have um, kind of lower dopamine activity in the brain. And so if we further, further block it with these medications, they will potentially experience worsening of their movement disorders. Um, so we would want to avoid the first generation antipsychotics in that population. Um, so these are just the different routes that are avail uh, available for the different agents. Um, we, the intravenous route of haloperidol isn't technically FDA approved, but you can use the intramuscular um, medication liquid intravenously. Um, you probably do here. So some things to consider with haloperidol is that androperidol is that they do decrease the seizure threshold. So in patients who potentially have um, frequent seizures, or we'll talk about this later, but are in alcohol withdrawal and potentially at risk for seizures, we do want to avoid these agents uh, potentially in those populations. A dose or two likely isn't going to harm your patient, but with frequent dosing, something to think about. Um, and then droperidol isn't FDA approved for the treatment of agitation, uh, but we do frequently use it, uh, at least at my hospital. All right, moving on to second generation antipsychotics. Second generation is thought to be safer in this population. It has um, less dopamine antagonism, so it has less of those sort of movement disorders, but it does have um, uh, antagonism at serotonin receptors, which is kind of unique for this population, especially with ziprazidone has the highest serotonin antagonism. And then some of these agents also have histamine receptor blockade, um, and that's typically with olanzapine and risperidone, and that can actually lead to increased orthostatic hypotension. So we do wanna be very cautious in our elderly patients that sometimes have orthostasis to begin with. So just some things to consider. Um, so olanzapine, um, I do like olanzapine because it is one of the, um, second generation antipsychotics that have very good efficacy against both psychosis and agitation. So if you do think your patient has underlying psychosis, olanzapine at the doses that we're recommending um, is one of the agents that will actually treat the underlying psychiatric illness. Um, but something to consider, olanzapine has a very long half-life. And so with multiple doses, they can really kind of creep up on you and your patient can remain sedated for quite a long period of time. Um, risperidone isn't used very often because it's only available in the oral um, option, so you can't use it intramuscularly or intravenously. And there is an increased risk of stroke um, and, uh, in our elderly patients who have um, a history of cardiovascular disease, so something to consider. And then ziprazidone, um, frequent hospitals will use ziprazidone. We don't um, very often at my hospital. Um, you can give it intramuscularly. It does have a risk, again, of orthostatic hypotension due to its histamine receptor um, agonism. But something to consider, it does inhibit CYP2D6, and this is an enzyme in your liver. And this enzyme does metabolize fluoxetine, peroxetine, and bupropion. And so these medications will have less metabolism and will build up in the body. And um, if we think about our elderly patients, um, Frequently, they are on some of these antidepressants, and so this would be a drug-drug interaction that you would potentially want to avoid if you think that the patient will be getting multiple doses of the ziprazidone. Um, and this is just a summary of those. And just like haloperidol, olanzapine isn't FDA-approved via the intravenous route, but you can use the intramuscular solution um, intravenously. All right, so when we talk about ketiapine or um, Seroquel, the guidelines currently don't support the use because um, you would reach for it for its antipsychotic properties, but you need doses above 200 milligrams to really get those antipsychotic properties. So when we're giving the doses of like 25 milligrams, 50 milligrams, we're really only getting that sort of sedative effect. It's not a great sedative anyway, but out of all of the second generation antipsychotics, it does have the least um, risk of movement disorders. And so 
The one population that we do consider using it in is those with Parkinson's or the Lewy body um, dementia. And I will just point out that um, none of the antipsychotics are FDA approved for dementia related psychosis due to increased risk of cerebrovascular adverse events in our older patients. So that's all on our antipsychotics. Um, we'll move on to our benzodiazepines. So um, I will just say we try to avoid our benzodiazepines in our elderly patients as much as we can, just due to some patients due to the increased sensitivity with the receptor um, changes that you get as you age. They do potentially have a prolonged sedation. Um, some will have paradoxical agitation that further worsens their agitation. Um, and then potentially respiratory depression. Typically we won't see respiratory depression as much if we don't combine it with other agents, but definitely um, a, a larger concern in this patient population. Um, but if the patient is chronically on benzodiazepines, you, you don't want to stop them um, during their hospital stay because potentially they would go into withdrawal. And these are the preferred agent if your patient is in um, alcohol or benzodiazepine withdrawal and that's what is causing their agitation. When we think about what benzodiazepines to use, um, our most common agents are the lorazepam, midazolam, or diazepam. Lorazepam or, and midazolam are preferred because they are shorter acting, and so they will wear off um, quicker. Um, and, then, and that's because the diazepam, it, it actually has an active metabolite, so even after it's metabolized, it has activity um, in, the, in the body. And then if you do want um, very quick calming of the patient, we do prefer midazolam because it has, it's more lipophilic and so it crosses the blood brain barrier faster. And so you'll have a faster onset of action with midazolam compared to lorazepam. Um, let's see, so lorazepam does have, uh, you can give the oral tablet sublingually. Um, so it's something just to consider if the patient cannot swallow. But again, you have your intramuscular and intravenous route, uh, as well as with midazolam. All right, so how many of you have heard of PAC or B52 as combinations? <laughs> yeah, so these are very common combinations of medications that we reach for in the United States. So HAC stands for Haldol, Ativan, and Cogentin. So, um, so you've got your first generation antipsychotic, your benzo, and then cogentin is um, added to help alleviate those movement disorders. Um, we do want to avoid the, uh, and then B52 is Benadryl, um, five of Haldol, and then, uh, sorry, Benadryl, five of Haldol, two of um, lorazepam. So again, a similar combination, the Benadryl is added to help with those movement disorders. We don't want to use combinations up front in our elderly patients just because, like I said, they're more sensitive. You want to avoid benzodiazepines if you can due to the increased sedation. So I'm glad you guys don't use these, um, but in the U.S. this is a frequent education point. All right, what about ketamine? Um, I am typically a big fan of ketamine, um, but there is minimal data in our elderly patients to support the use of ketamine. Um, studies that um, compare ketamine head-to-head -head with different benzodiazepines and antipsychotics, not specifically in the elderly patient, elderly population, do show that ketamine has a faster onset of action um, compared to either class. So it is a very effective calming agent. Um, we just don't have enough studies looking at its safety and efficacy in our older patients. All right. So like I said, when we are treating agitation, we really wanna think about what the cause of the agitation is. And so this is a chart just to give you the most recommended agents um, based on the cause. So if we, we don't know the cause, um, benzodiazepines are our first line agents. So again, these, this isn't specifically in our geriatric population, this is in the population at large. Um, if, it, if the patient, we know the patient has an underlying psychiatric disorder, we want to use our antipsychotic agents. Um, and then second line, you can add a, a benzodiazepine if the antipsychotic agent isn't effective. We do want to avoid ketamine if, in our patients with psychiatric disorders if possible, just because they can have increased um, risk of the emergence reaction that we can see with ketamine. And then in this population, we don't want to start off with a benzo because it will only really sedate the patient. It won't treat their underlying um, psychiatric disorder. 
the patient is agitated due to alcohol or other CNS depressants, we want to avoid benzodiazepines because you'll get further CNS depression. So um, antipsychotics are your first line. Um, currently in the guidelines, it's only Helperidol. Um, frequently we will now use Droperidol, so they're kind of interchangeable if you do use them, use Droperidol in your practice in the future. And then adding on ketamine um, is very effective. Again, we want to avoid benzos. And then if your patient is agitated due to a stimulant or if they're in alcohol withdrawal, this is when we would consider our benzodiazepines first line and then our ketamine. Again, we potentially want to avoid our antipsychotics in our alcohol withdrawal patients just because they're at increased risk of seizure disorders. So this is kind of a helpful schematic um, of a paper that I wrote with one of my provider colleagues who specializes in ger geriatric medicine, but it's really just kind of, if a, if a geriatric patient presents to the emergency department um, and we need uh, to get a clinical assessment and we're unable, kind of what is the flow that we ask ourselves? So because we know um, oftentimes this patient population presents with a painful condition um, and isn't able to verbalize it, that was our first question that we thought would be most important is it possible that our patient is in pain? So do they have a history of falling? Do they have a history of maybe a bed sore, something like that? Um, if we think yes, then we wanna treat that pain first. Um, if the patient is able to take oral medications, Tylenol, low-dose oxycodone, if they're in severe pain, um, we chose hydromorphone. Um, if we don't think it's a painful condition, uh, and, and the medication needs to um, have a quick effect, um, then we look at lorazepam. So our benzodiazepines have um, a very fast onset of action. That's when we would do our intravenous. If we don't need the medication to act very quickly and the patient is on a home antipsychotic or a benzodiazepine, then we should just give that orally. If they're not on that, then we say, is there a clinical reason that we would choose one drug over the other? And the clinical reason that I talked about is if they have the Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia. If they do, then we go to our Seroquel because again, that has the lowest dopamine antagonism. Or if we need a, a intravenous option, again, potentially a benzodiazepine. If they don't have any of these conditions and we can give an oral medication, we look for uh, catiapine or olanzapine, parenterally olanzapine. But again, keep in mind that olanzapine has a pretty long um, duration of action. So just consider that with your dosing. And then when we look at specific geriatric um, clinical conditions for dementia, there's really no FDA approved medication to treat dementia related agitation or psychosis as we talked about, but our clinical recommendations are to use um, second generation um, antipsychotics as first line. And then delirium, we typically reach for, again, our second generation antipsychotics. So I put this table in here just to point out um, the time to drug effect and then how long the drug will act. So when we look at droperidol, droperidol and midazolam, as we talked about, have the quickest onset of action. But when we reach for things like olanzapine, you might be waiting 10 to 20 minutes to actually see the, the drug take effect. So we always just wanna keep that in mind when we're, we're giving a medication two minutes later, we're reassessing the patient saying they're still agitated, it's not working, let's give something else. Um, so just keep in mind that these drugs take a while to kick in and they also potentially um, last longer in the body due to, again, they have decreased hepatic clearance, they have decreased renal clearance. Um, and then if we look at drugs like olanzapine, the duration can actually be 12 to 24 hours. So just keep in mind that if you give a high dose of medication, you might be dealing with um, unwanted side effects for a longer period of time than you'd like to. So some geriatric considerations um, in the end when treating agitation, pharmacologic agents are second line to our non-pharm agents. Um, second generation antipsychotics are preferred in this patient population. We want to avoid benzodiazepines if able, um, unless our patient is withdrawing from benzodiazepines or are in alcohol withdrawal. And ketamine just doesn't have enough data to support it at this time. Administering medications orally is preferred. Um, dose matters. So using, we always kind of say the phrase, start low, go slow in this patient population. So you, using the lowest dose possible and titrating slowly is most important. 
Um, we always uh, talk about just adding medications as needed or symptom triggered. Um, I frequently see um, antipsychotics being added on our geriatric patients scheduled, and then they leave the hospital and it's still on their medication list and they're just never really removed. So doing um, as needed dosing, in my opinion, is preferred. And then just reassessing frequently and down, down titrating the medication and discontinuing it as soon as possible. All right, so what is your go-to medication or combination of medications when treating just the undifferentiated agitated patient? Mm -hmm. Is there a specific medication that you think about? Is there a specific medication that you think about? Right. Yep. So calming the patient so you can get your assessment, finding the underlying cause and treating that. Does anyone have a specific medication that? Not a specific one, but what is the key? Uh, most of the time, polyphenol is one of the drugs of choice in this case. Mm -hmm. We have elderly patients coming in with few medications in their bathroom, and you need actually to calm down because uh, it implies a lot of energy from all the mental stuff, the emotional stuff. So, as a good medication for the moment, polyphenol is definitely we can use in the arsenic, we can use the beam and stuff. Oh, Yep. Good. Would this change if the patient was geriatric? So you guys don't use second generation antipsychotics very often. Ciprazidone, olanzapine, no. Awesome. All right. So that is the end of kind of the agitation portion. We're gonna move on to pain management. Any questions about agitation that I can answer? Yes, one is a little bit of topic, but it's about ketamine in the geriatric patient. Uh, you seem like you keep telling us that we should avoid ketamine whenever we can. Uh, but has a rationale to be used when we want to do some procedural stuff, for example, and then Direction on an elderly patient, so we want also to uh, uh, exploit the energetic aspect of ketamine. Do you think for procedural stuff, so to get actually to date the patient, should be a reasonable, a reasonable choice? Oh, yes. Um, so I love ketamine and I think it's great for procedural sedation, both in our adult and pediatric population. It's just that treating agitation specifically in our geriatric population is where we don't have enough data. So I think ketamine is great for say, your 40 year old patient who comes in um, agitated potentially due like stimulants, something like that. I think, I think that there's definitely a place for using ketamine for agitation. Um, it's just not well studied in geriatrics. Um, but I think ketamine is great for procedural sedation. I think it's great low dose for pain. Um, I think there's a lot of good uses for ketamine in the emergency department. Any other questions? All right. So when we talk about um, pain management in our geriatric population, again, we want to use the lowest doses of our medications as possible. And so this is really when multimodal therapy comes into play. And when you talk about multimodal therapy, this is when you use different agents together that have different mechanisms for treating the pain. And so you can see kind of in the circle, we think about using Tylenol, NSAIDs being like our Ketorolac, Ibuprofen, potentially using more topical agents. Topical agents are really great in our geriatric population since they don't have as much sort of systemic absorption and less side effects, especially if the pain is localized. 
um, potentially using low dose opioids. And then we, when we think about our CNS medications, we think about like our, um, our antipsychotics, those are less used because they take longer to titrate. So they're not super relevant for the emergency department, but potentially for long-term use, um, you could think about those agents as well. So when we think about Tylenol, so Tylenol has uh, antipyretics, so it decreases fevers and has um, analgesic effects, so pain effects, but we need to keep in mind that it doesn't have any anti-inflammatory properties. So if your patient's pain is really due to inflammation, Tylenol might not be as effective. Um, I always recommend scheduling the Tylenol around the clock. We frequently do as needed Tylenol and then Sometimes the nurse will reach more for like the low dose opioid versus the Tylenol. So just making sure that it's around the clock so you don't have like those holes in, um, in therapy. Um, we obviously have oral, rectal, and intravenous. I know inter the intravenous route is very popular um, just because it's easy and you'd rather give intravenous than say rectal if they can't take oral, but studies have shown that it is not more effective than other routes. Um, do you guys use a lot of IV Tylenol here? Yes. Yeah. It used to be a bigger deal because it used to cost more. Now it's fairly cost effective. Um, but just keep in mind that the other routes are equally uh, as effective. And studies have shown that there's no additional benefit going above a gram per dose of Tylenol. And we shouldn't exceed, again, the four grams um, per day in in our young healthy population, but in patients with liver disease and specifically our elderly patients, we try to limit the daily dose to three grams. And then moving on to our NSAIDs. So our NSAIDs have the um, antipyretics, so the fever properties, the pain killing properties, as well as anti-inflammatory effects. Um, when we pick a dip, when we choose between different NSAIDs, we have to think about um, the risk of potentially bleeding. So having a GI bleed versus the cardiovascular risk. Um, so if your patient has a history of GI bleeds, we might want to consider um, celecoxib. I don't know if your hospital um, has that or diclofenac. Um, versus if they have a cardiovascular risk, um, we could consider naproxen. So just some things to weigh. Again, if we're just using them for uh, a few days, likely either risk is not high. Um, if, you do, if you do have a concern about GI bleeds, sometimes we'll just add a proton pump inhibitor to um, alleviate that for the few days that they're on the NSAIDs. Um, and again, there's no additional benefit going above 400 milligrams per dose of ibuprofen or 10 milligrams per dose of Ketorolac. I know before these studies came out, we would often give 30 milligrams of Ketorolac, 60 milligrams of Ketorolac to all of our patients. Um, but I do want to say, if your patient truly has inflammation causing the pain, higher doses of Ketorolac might actually be more effective. And then um, just consider caution in your perioperative patients due to the increased risk of bleed. I want your opinion. Um, yeah. So many of our elderly patients and other patients take aspirin. Yes. Most of them take 81 milligrams. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on utilizing NSAIDs on patients who are already on, let's say, 81 milligrams of aspirin? Because in our electronic medical record, there's a hard stop. Often we'll not even let you order it. What's, what's your take on that? Like yeah. I mean, again, I think it's about like duration as well as like what's their past medical history. So in someone who has like no history of bleed, their renal function is fine. We think that they're clearing the medication well. It's likely only going to be a week or less of therapy. Um, I would think it's fine. Uh, I think once you get the patient who's on aspirin, apixaban, <laughs> and then I probably wouldn't. But if they're on just low dose aspirin, I'd I would think it's okay. A lot of the patients will say, oh, my doctor told me I'm taking aspirin. I can't catch it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's often the choice versus purposes of really what's taking mm -hmm. home. Like that. Yep. So it's always good to hear from people. Definitely. Um, we have providers that even if they're not on aspirin, they try to, they shy away from uh, Ketorolac in elderly patients. Um, I definitely am pro, especially like you said, for things like kidney stones. Um, or like root fractures, things of that sort. Um, so I, I'm a proponent of the NSAIDs. Uh, and when we think about gabapentinoids, so uh, gabapentinoids, they don't bind the GABA receptor. A lot of people think that they do due to their name, but they actually bind presynaptic, presynaptic calcium channels. So they reduce the flow of calcium into the nerves and just kind of decrease the nerve firing. And that's how they help treat pain. 
They're most effective for um, post-herpetic neuralgia, phantom limb pain, peripheral neuropathy, things of that sort, but they do take a long time to titrate. So typically, like gabapentin will start at 200 milligrams three times a day. You have to titrate it every week or two up to the effective dose. So it usually takes three or four weeks to get to that dose. So not something that you would see um, analgesic properties right away. But another thing that I want to point out, so some patients will say that they didn't have any response to gabapentin, and then we automatically think that they'll also not respond to pergabalin. But the binding affinity and the potency of pergabalin is actually six times higher than gabapentin. And gabapentin actually has the saturable oral absorption. So once you reach about 800 milligrams, the efficacy or the additional pain properties you get are pretty minimal the higher you go. And so I usually recommend instead of increasing the dose, I say keep the dose the same and increase the frequency. Um, however, you can just avoid all that by uh, prescribing pergabalin, which doesn't have the saturable oral absorption and it has more linear kinetics. And so the higher the dose you get, typically the more um, pain relief properties it has. So just a little pearl to consider. And then, like I said, the topical agents are great in this patient population. We've got a lot of, um, a lot of different agents. Are, are these typically over the counter for you guys or do you need a prescription? It depends on the dose. Over the counter, okay. Yeah, so they're usually pretty um, easy for the patients to get uh, in, in the pharmacy. So here's a little chart I just wanted to give you guys on different um, painful conditions and what sort of agents we think are good combinations. So when you think about our musculoskeletal pain, we think of our NSAIDs, uh, Tylenol, topical agents, and then potentially if it is more severe, our low dose ketamine. Um, kidney stones or renal colic, as we were talking about, NSAIDs are fantastic, Tylenol. Um, IV lidocaine, sometimes we will do, is pretty effective for kidney stones and then low-dose ketamine. Um, lower back pain, again, NSAIDs, Tylenol. Um, if it is more of like spasms or spasticity, you might think of doing diazepam or tizanidine. Um, migraines, we have uh, our triptans, our dopaminergic drugs, and NSAIDs. Uh, and then neuropathic pain, this is really when we reach toward our gabapentinoids, potentially IV lidocaine, things of that sort. And that's where we get into like our CNS medications. All right, so that's the end of our pain management. Any questions I can answer about that? All right. Moving on to our last section, urinary tract infections. As we all know, our pretty common uh, uh, presentations, findings in this patient population. Um, but I will say urinary tract infections are frequently overdiagnosed and overtreated in the setting of a positive urine analysis or urine culture in the absence of symptoms. So I know at my hospital, I think everyone gets a urine analysis, even if they have zero complaints of a urinary tract infections. So just something to keep in mind. And elderly patients are, um, have much higher incidence of actually treating asymptomatic bacteria than other patient populations, because we often think that that's the reason that they fell, that's the reason that they're altered, and sometimes it's really hard to kind of piece out, is that actually the reason? Um, however, just keep in mind that treating asymptomatic bacteria can actually lead to increased adverse events like uh, antibiotic resistance in this population when we use it when it's not needed. <coughs> And so this is um, just a chart that we typically use for um, what does like a UTI actually look like, so, and when should we treat it? So localized would be like your dysuria, urgency, frequency, if you have uh, suprapubic pain, potentially pilo, flank pain. Um, when we think about more of our urosepsis, so our uh, systemic um, uh, signs and symptoms would be like hypotension, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, leukocytosis. These are all patients who have symptomatic urinary tract infections, potentially urosepsis. When patients likely don't have a urinary tract infection, and this is the patient population that we'll typically treat unnecessarily, would be they just have cloudy urine, foul smelling urine, dark urine. Oftentimes our elderly patients don't drink a lot of fluids, and so the urine can be very concentrated. That can lead to these different um, uh, presentations that may not actually be a urinary tract infection. So some antibiotic pearls. So uh, 
do you have, does a large population of your patients have uh, antibiotic allergies on their profile, like penicillin allergies, things of that sort? Yeah. So I think it is incredibly important, and I harp on this all the time, is to really clinically assess the uh, antibiotic allergies. So do they actually know what happened? Did their mom just tell them it happened? How long ago did it happen? We know that 90, about 90% 90 of antibiotic allergies go away in 10 years. So if your geriatric patient is 65 years old and when they were a baby, they had an allergic reaction, they likely don't have it anymore because A, the drugs are much more pure. They had a lot of contaminants back in the day that led to a lot of the allergic reactions. Um, and B, they probably just grew out of it. So continuously reassessing the allergy is, is important because a lot of our medications like our penicillin and cephalosporins are our most effective antibiotics. Um, do you guys use a lot of nitrofurin toin? No. Um, we typically like nitrofurin uh, um, because it concentrates in the kidneys. So there's not a whole lot of systemic absorption of, we, do you call it macrobid here? Macrodantin? No, nitrofurin tone. I'll stick with nitrofurin tone. Um, so you don't get a lot of antibiotic resistance to nitrofurin tone, but in our geriatric patients, like we said, oftentimes their blood flow to the kidneys is lower, and so they have less clearance. Nitrofurantoin won't actually get to the bladder where it needs to work, and so it will essentially just be ineffective if you use it in patients who have a clearance of less than 30. So just be very cautious. The studies have actually shown that if uh, patients have several courses of nitrofurantoin throughout their life, they actually have increased risk of pulmonary fibrosis. So um, also something to kind of look in their chart if they've had it in the past. Fluoroquinolones in geriatric patients uh, recently, um, kind of recently, probably over the last 10 years, have kind of gotten a, a bad rap because they do lead to increased altered mental status in this patient population. Um, we do see the potential increased risk of aortic dissection in these patients. Um, so fluoroquinolones are not our favorite. Um, sometimes you need to use them because they're the only oral option that would treat like a pseudomonal UTI. Um, but just, just caution in your elderly patients. And then some of our patients are also on warfarin. There are several antibiotic drug drug interactions with warfarin, including Bactrim and fluoroquinolones. And so you'll have an increased INR, increased risk of bleeding. Um, and then I always recommend not switching between antibiotic classes. So oftentimes in the ED, we'll see someone who has started on say IV ceftriaxone, and then when they go home, they'll switch them to say ciprofloxacin where they could have just kept them on an oral cephalosporin. Um, so just if you can remain in the same class when you're switching intravenous to oral, um, I always recommend that. And then do you guys use aminoglycosides, say tobramycin or gentamicin for urinary tract infections? Yes. Do you just do one dose? Well, you're way ahead of us then. Um, this is a, a kind of a new thing in our emergency departments, um, just one dose of either gentamicin or tobramycin for uh, kind of a simple urinary tract infection. If they have pylo, then sometimes we'll increase the dose to three. But this is really great in our geriatric population because they have less drug exposure. Um, it has very broad coverage uh, and it costs minimal amount of money. Um, so. It, one dose of aminoglycosides is really great for this patient population. And then this is just an example of a sort of therapeutic plan that we created at MGH that breaks down if it's acute cystitis, if they have presence of potentially um, systemic, uh, potentially urosepsis, and then if it's pylo. So this is something that um, I think is very helpful to providers, uh, especially you could make it geriatric specific. But I just wanted to give you an example of a treatment pathway that we, that we made. And we recently, in red, added the gentamicin single doses to that. And I'm happy to share these slides as well. All right, that is the end of urinary tract infections. Any questions about that? <laughs> All right, well, that concludes my part. Thank you so much for listening and your questions, and I'll turn it over to Lex.
Thank you, Jenny. Do you have comments from uh, people from uh, online connection? Fatevi sentire, prego. No, però io ho commentato direttamente alla, alla ragazza e aveva già risposto lei all'inizio. Ok. Please. Uh, we, uh, probably there are a lot of uh, questions to, to discuss, uh, but we can discuss uh, later at the end and also during the dinner this night, probably. Uh, because uh, what is important to understand the presentation about uh, geriatric emergency medicine. Però se possono andare emergency medicine. All right, can everyone online also see the slides? Probably. Uh, I have to ask. Uh, si può vedere able, tutto? Uh, yes, okay, are you able to see uh, Tom? Qualcuno a casa può rispondere? Se potete vedere? Sì, sì. Yeah. Perfetto. Sì, sì, si vede. All right. So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Lexi Azro. Some of you probably know me already. Um, I've been working with Giovanni for a long time. I've been to Pavia a few times. So today um, I'm going to talk to you in conjunction with what Jenny discussed about all these drugs. I'm going to talk about clinical cases. Okay, so this is less of a lecture and more of a discussion. So I really want your participation. This is really important because I think that's really what's going to make this useful for everyone. Okay, so we talk about emergency medicine, we talk about different age groups. And, you know, we talk about, especially with pediatrics, that kids are not just little adults, right? Well, geriatric patients are not just cute adults. They're, they have different physiology, they have different needs, and it's really our job, because they're such a large portion of our patients, to be aware of these things and to treat them accordingly. So what is the problem here? We have a different population. They often have complex medical history, as we talked about polypharmacy, changes in cognitive abilities. Sometimes they can't tell you exactly what they need or what's going on. And they have changes in their physiology. The other big difference is they have very different social needs, and that's also part of our job to consider. So these are all things we need to think about with this population. They also often present differently. Okay, we think about the textbook presentations for this or that. Well, the, they finished school a long time ago. They didn't bother reading the textbook, and then they come in with a completely different presentation than what you would expect. Okay? They often have very atypical symptoms, atypical exam findings, and other confounding factors from chronic problems they might have that look very similar to what they're having in the acute setting. Another thing that we have to consider based on all of these other changes is we have to take extra care when taking a history or a physical exam, okay? We have to ask questions a certain way to get the answers that we actually want versus the answers that we're given, okay? We'll have discussion about this. Another thing we have to consider is taking extra care for their comfort, not just because of their condition, but also because as we discussed a lot with the agitation, this may be a big difference in an agitated patient or a calm patient simply because the bed they're on is not comfortable or some other reason. Does anyone know how long does it take if you have a patient on a backboard? How long does it take before a pressure ulcer starts to form? Does anybody know? Take a guess. One hour one hour, okay? Especially in an elderly patient who has less muscle mass, less adipose tissue. So we have to really be, if they say, oh, this bed is really uncomfortable, they know they're not joking. It really, it really can cause problems. So please be considerate about that. 
And because of these things, we have to have a different, different diagnostic and treatment approach. And finally, the elderly have different social needs, as I mentioned, so we have to really consider their disposition. You can't just send them home sometimes. You have to think about what home are they going to? What kind of help do they have at home? Are they gonna be able to pick up the prescription that you gave them for their antibiotic? Are they gonna be able to remember how to take those things? Are they forgetful? So these are all different needs that this population has that the general population does not. So we're gonna start with case number one. And you'll see some similar themes in all of these cases. But what I want you to see is not everything that looks like one thing is actually that thing. It might be something else, okay? So case number one, grandma fell again. How, how often do you see that the chief complaint of the elderly patient is a fall, right? I would say it's quite a bit. So 86 year old female comes by private vehicle she was found on the grass in front of her house by the car. She doesn't drive. She's confused, and her family says this isn't normal for her, and she doesn't even know how she got to the hospital. So here's a little bit more history. According to the family, she's been a little bit slow the last few days. Yesterday, she didn't go to her card game with her friends. She didn't feel good. Maybe she didn't eat dinner so good last night. Maybe she slept a little bit more. She took a nap today. That's not usual for her. She usually gets up at night to use the bathroom quite a bit. That's usual for her. No one is sick at home. She's usually a little bit forgetful, but she normally knows where she is. She lives at home with her family. She usually takes her medications, but the family isn't sure if she did today. She doesn't drink or use any drugs, and she hasn't been sick. So what other questions would you want to ask this patient and family? So her daughter helps pick up her medications. She puts them in a little pill box, and the patient usually remembers to take them herself, but sometimes she forgets. Has she problems with blood pressure? Has she what? Problems with blood pressure. So that's on our next slide. Let's move on. So here's a little bit more about her history. She has history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She's a diabetic. She has known coronary artery disease. She has a history of gout and some mild dementia. Her surgical history is a hysterectomy and a hip replacement. There's a list of her medications. So she's not on a lot of medication, but she's on a few. And she's allergic to penicillin, okay? Here's a little bit about her vital signs. These are the pertinent parts of the exam. So her vitals look pretty okay. Temperature's borderline. She's oriented to herself. She kind of knows she's in the hospital, but not really sure where exactly. H-E-E-N-T is normal. Cardiovascular, you hear a little bit of a murmur, but that otherwise okay. Her lungs are clear. Her abdomen is soft and non-tender. You don't see any signs of injury on her extremities, even though she was found on the ground. Her skin looks okay. But she's a little confused and she's a little agitated. And she keeps saying, I have to go pick up my son at school. I have to go pick him up at school. But she's in her 80s, so obviously she doesn't. Okay, so she's a little confused and a little bit agitated. So what do you want to order for this patient? What tests are we ordering? Just call it out. I'm all right? Yeah. Off the bat, right away? In this agitated patient? Do you think she'll sit still? No. Probably not. You want to jump to that? What do we think? So let's take a step back. Let's make a differential diagnosis. If you're having trouble deciding what to order, let's think about what we're looking for, and that will help you decide what to order. So what are some of the possibilities of why this patient is a little more confused and fell? Maybe. Hmm? Yep. 
Sure. Medication error or not taking medications. What else? Maybe we can consider a urinary tract infection or sure. because of the urinary tract and the end of the sure. So we can do a urinary tract while it's satisfied and without delaying other possible diagnoses. Okay. What else? Have ever been tested for glycemis? What was that? Have uh, ever been tested for glycemia? I put it here. Sorry. For the glucose blood. Sure, she's diabetic, so we, we want to check about her glucose. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Remember, she's a diabetic. What else? Maybe she's in pain. Sure. She fell on the ground, so we don't know if she has any other injuries, right? Any other ideas? Then we do probably assume that she won't fall. Sure. So no one saw her fall, right? We don't know why she fell. We don't know. So based on this, so what types of tests do we want to start with based on these ideas? Blood sign for sure an ECG. Okay. And we can do an ultrasound. Of? Of a new cardiac. What are we looking for? For dilated right chamber. Which could, uh, on one side, pulmonary embolism, on the other side, if you see PT, some areas of uh, hypotheses. Does that explain why she fell or why she's confused? And then we can also have a syncope on an um, arctic valve uh, stenosis. Okay. So we can take that. You can try. Of course. <laughs> and uh, since she's confused as a neurological syndrome, it's, we also probably look for a CBC. Yes. Because also That's what I was looking for. So you said MRI. For, for the quick test, you start with the CT. So real quickly, what, what are the different things you would see on a CT scan versus an MRI? What's the different things you would be looking for? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know very much in okay. between scan sure. and uh, MRI. Sure. But basically, if you did have an MRI, you can see if she had a stroke sure. or if uh, she had some problems uh, in the hemisphere and seminar or there is some splitting. Sure. And maybe have an MRI or a CT or a CT scan. Yeah. That's so the first thing that sure. jumps in my mind. So let me explain the difference. A CT scan is short. It takes a minute. An MRI takes 30 to 60, okay? Yeah. So that's one big difference. A CT scan is usually our first line for intracranial hemorrhage, okay? That's what the quick thing we want to rule out, the worst possibilities first. And so a CT scan is usually pretty good for that, or skull fractures, or sort of like the big stuff, right? You think about MRI more of the subtle things, like a subtle stroke or a subacute stroke, stuff like that. But that would be something we can do later once we've ruled out the bad stuff because it takes longer. Okay, so that's what you would utilize the different things. So a CT scan is quick. It'll tell you if there's bleeding or fractures. An MRI is if you can't find another reason, you might want to consider that later on to rule out more subtle things. Are we ordering any blood tests? What are we ordering? Okay. Biochemistry. Yep. Okay. What are you looking for for that? Is that going to change your management acutely in the emergency department? Is procalcitonin in the emergency department actually associated with bacterial infections or is it poorly correlated? Poorly correlated. So procalcitonin is not an emergency room test. That's something that you would utilize later on in the ICU or on the floor, let's say to differentiate between an infectious bacterial pneumonia or something else. But it's not a test that's going to help you right now. So our job is to decide what is going to change my management today, right now, versus later on. So my approach is let's look for the worst things first. And once we rule out the worst things, then we can look at the more subtle things later, like a bacterial versus a viral infection. But we don't even know that there is an infection yet, right? So we have to see 
So what did we do? Let's move on. So here's a few things we looked at. Here's your blood count. Your AccuCheck was okay. There's your electrolytes. Maybe the creatinine's a little bit higher than usual. Potassium's a tiny bit low. Okay. So we got a CT of the head. You can see there's a little bit of age-related changes, but no bleeding, no fractures. We got a chest x-ray because there's another place you have common infections, right? Or common things that you would see from a fall. It looks okay, nothing acute. We got a pelvis x-ray. Anytime an elderly person falls, you want to make sure chest and pelvis, okay? You press on the pelvis to make sure it's stable, but a lot of the time when they come in, they haven't actually stood up or tried to walk since they fell. So maybe they don't even notice that something is hurting them. So it's, I generally will order both a chest and a pelvis on a fall just to rule out gross abnormalities, okay? So we see her hip replacement, but everything else looks okay. So we have a normal CT head, a normal chest x-ray, normal pelvis x-ray. Our, our EKG that we ordered was fine, it was normal. What else do we need? We said it before. Now, this touches on what Jenny was talking about at the end. So how do you interpret, particularly in the elderly, to avoid over-treating for UTIs that aren't really UTIs? This would be, in my opinion, an example of truly a urinary tract infection. What's the big difference here? The nitrites. Positive nitrites is much more closely associated with a true infection. Most of the time, what do we see on the urinalysis? Small leukocyte esterase, six to 10 WBCs, right? That's our usual, like, is it a UTI? I don't know. For that type of thing, I would just send it for a culture and wait. For this type of result, I would treat this, okay? This would explain the low-grade fever, the confusion, Maybe she's a little confused. She thought she had to pick up her son from school and she was trying to run and that's why she fell, okay? So this is just kind of a simple example of one type of presentation that did have increased white blood cells, slightly increased temperature, and the confusion, which would be a symptomatic infection, okay? So what are we gonna do with this patient? How are we going to treat her? Well, first we're gonna order a urine culture, right? We're gonna make sure we send a urine for a culture so we know what bacteria it is so later on we can adjust our treatment. One thing that I always do, especially with elderly patients, if you have an electronic medical record, you can look back in the chart and see if they have any prior urine cultures because oftentimes if they had a prior resistant organism, they'll have it again. So try to treat based on a prior culture. Let's say we don't have any prior cultures. What would be your first choice antibiotic for this patient with these findings? We just talked about this right before. Gentamicin, that's a good choice. What else can we think about? So we, we know we don't wanna use things like macrobid, like um, nitrofurantoin, right? That's not a good choice. So what are some other, let's say, oral choices that we could consider? What would you send a patient home with to take for this instead of gentamicin, let's say? Hmm? Phosphomycin is, a, is an option. That's a one-time dose. What about a cephalosporin? They're pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Cephodoxine. Cephuroxine, those are all options that you can use, okay? Now this patient is allergic to penicillin, supposedly. When I consider a cephalosporin in a patient who's allergic to penicillin, just like Jenny mentioned, I ask them, well, what was your allergy? And most of them will say, I don't know, I had a rash, or my mom said I was allergic when I was a baby to amoxicillin, right? Unless they have anaphylaxis, truly documented anaphylaxis to penicillins, I generally am okay to use a cephalosporin. If they truly say I, I have anaphylaxis, I have to use epinephrine if I get penicillin, then I would avoid cephalosporins, okay? 
What about disposition? Does this patient need to stay in the hospital or do we think she can go home? What are some of the factors you would consider for this patient? So who does she live with? She lives with her family. They brought her today, right? So she has help at home. She lives with her family. She has a safe place to go. Do you think she's safe to go home? Or do you think she needs to be admitted to the hospital? And how would you make that decision in real life? I'm asking, what would you really do in this case? So ask the patient, ask the family, are you able to help her? Do you feel comfortable taking her home? Do you think she's okay to go home? Are you able to help her with her medication? So those are the types of questions you would ask. I would say in this case, this patient can probably go home. I don't think there's anything here that requires hospitalization. She has a safe place to go, and she has a known problem that we can treat. So I think this patient can go home either having a dose of gentamicin in the emergency department or with a prescription to take at home. And then the other important thing you want to always mention when you discharge a patient, particularly older patients, is make sure they have a follow-up appointment. Make sure they have a doctor they can go see, that if there's a problem or there's another issue that they're going to go see their doctor. And I always say, you need to make an appointment next week with your doctor to make sure you're feeling better. They can check your urine again and make sure the infection has gone away and make sure that someone will follow up with this patient who you're sending home, okay? Questions about this case? Usually, if, uh, um, that's a problem because if we have urine and blood cultures, uh, probably we wait uh, the result before uh, sending out the patient. So we will, I wouldn't rely so much on the Italian family doctor system, this addition that they stay with the patient within a week, especially now with some with COVID, like they do three less or less visits than before. So I would rely a lot. Probably if we have we have small cultures, probably yes, also because then it's kind of problematic to contact again the patient before we have the uh, after the return to our Okay. So I think that um, it's a little bit different here because you're allowed to keep a patient in the emergency department for two days. In the United States, we can't. We just can't. We have to keep things moving. And so I think it's it would not be considered standard practice to do that. So maybe it's something to think about if there would be a way to start a system for your hospital to have someone in charge of following up on cultures. If there is a positive culture or a resistant culture to be able to rely on the fact that someone will call the patient 
versus you know use, utilizing resources like that to have a patient sit for two days just for a culture result. That might be something you could think about as a way to improve the throughput. Yeah, we have basically some kind of steps that are performed in the process of log testing and stuff like mm -hmm. that that are done in a patient clinic. It's just now for lumbar D and for other reasons with other health care systems for budget reasons and the reason. And you build it by you have a personal healthcare portfolio folder. Mm -hmm. So you receive your data there and your family physician should be able to access that data as well. Right. But of course, like they, most of the people they won't. So that's why it's nice to have from the emergency department because in the way I always feel is if I order the test, I'm responsible for the results, right? But my shift ends. So something that won't come back before my shift ends, sometimes you can have someone who's appointed every day to just look through those results and make calls if they need to. It's just something to think about. All right, let's move on. Case number two. Grandma fell again, again. So now we have a 92-year-old female who comes after she slipped on the carpet in the kitchen while she was trying to get herself a cup of tea. She forgot to use her walker, and she was walking by herself. Her family heard her fall. She lives with her family, and they found her on the floor. She says her, her right side, her ribs hurt a little bit, but she's okay. She's okay. So... Family says she forgets to use her walker a lot. She doesn't like to use it, so she thinks in the house, it's okay, she can hold on to the walls. She seems like her usual self. She's at her baseline. The family says she couldn't stand up by herself, but they were able to help her up. Her daughter says, you know, she, she really doesn't complain about pain very much. Like, she kind of minimizes, but she wanted some acetaminophen at the house. She was complaining that she wanted something for pain. She's not sure if she hit her head. No one saw her fall, so we don't really know. But she does say her head hurts a little, just mild, like a little bit. I want some Tylenol. Okay. She normally is very sharp. She's usually oriented times three. She lives with her family. She is usually compliant with her medications. She does take warfarin for AFib. She doesn't drink. She doesn't use drugs. She hasn't been sick. So what other questions might you want to ask this patient and her family? Why don't we look at the next slide and then we can see. Here's her history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, atrial fibrillation. She has a remote history of breast cancer in remission, history of a mastectomy, cholecystectomy, and appendectomy. So she's taken out all the extra stuff. Here's her medication list. Not very much, but she is on warfarin. She has no allergies, and her social history is negative. Here's what we see on physical exam. Heart rate is a little, 103. We're not sure why. Respiratory rate is also a little bit high, 24. Her oxygen saturation is 92%. Her pressure is a little bit high, but she's oriented. She doesn't seem like she's in any distress. She's relaxed. On her exam, you find a small hematoma to her occipital scalp, but no bleeding. Her pupils are reactive. There's no midline cervical spine tenderness. On her CV exam, her pulse is irregularly irregular. We know she has AFib. When you look at her chest wall, she's got a little tenderness on the right side, just like a little tender. You press, eh, that hurts a little bit. But no hematoma, no crepitus. We don't really see anything on the outside of the chest wall. When you check her respiratory exam and you ask her to take a deep breath, she kind, of, she kind of winces when she takes a deep breath. And her lungs are a little bit diminished. Her abdomen is non-tender, her pelvis is stable, and you don't see any other signs of injury on her exam. Okay. So what are we ordering for this patient? What's our differential diagnosis? Let's start with that. Of what? Okay, tell me about that. Okay. So what kind of image would you want to order? What type of imaging would you order? What type? A 
okay, of, of the abdomen and the chest, okay, what else? Okay, the head, okay. What else do we wanna order? So this kind of sounds like a mechanical fall, right? So big difference, especially with elderly patients and falls, was it a mechanical fall or not a mechanical fall? Because that makes a big difference in what you want to check for. This sounds like a mechanical fall. She didn't have her walker, she tripped on the carpet, she's oriented, she can tell you what happened, okay? So we, we think this is more of a mechanical fall. So we're looking for more resulting injuries versus cause of the fall. So that's a big difference. Do we wanna order blood work or any other tests on this patient? Okay, and why would that be? So first of all, like, we, we didn't ask if she has any pain in the hips or legs. Mm -hmm. So we will ask for x-ray of the pelvis to mm -hmm. see if there is any kind of infection there. We may ask for hands for the chest and head, and if she was not working, so we will be maybe concerned about internal cannulite. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ask for scan of the chest, but in the meanwhile, we also so let's say this patient weighs 250 kilos. Exactly, which is most of our patients in the United States. So now what are we ordering right away? So a chest x-ray okay. and pelvic x-ray. Okay. Okay. What about blood tests? What are we looking for? Blood tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? She's on Coumadin, she's on Warfarin, so we need to know her INR, right? That's really important. Don't forget to check the INR. People often forget, they don't check the medication list, they don't realize the patient is on a blood thinner, and then it's later and you realize you never did it. So make sure you check that right away. Okay, it's good, especially in older patients, to take a look at their medication list before you order things to see if you need to check like an INR or let's say they're on digoxin, you might need to check a digoxin level, things like that, okay? So I think that's a good start. So here's what we got. So her INR is therapeutic, it's 2.4. Everything else looks pretty okay here. Here's her EKG, she's in AFib. We knew that, that's fine. Okay, so here's a chest x-ray. Now this is not a 250 kilogram patient, but this is a chest x-ray and this is kind of gonna demonstrate the point that I wanna bring across with this particular case. What do you see on this x-ray? Do you see anything abnormal? What do you see? And how do you, how do you look in a, in a consistent way every time to make sure you don't miss things on a chest x-ray. What's your method to do that? So there's the A, B, C, D, E, right? So airway looks okay, right? Walk me through this, what are we looking at? Bones? So we're we looking at clavicles, ribs. Do you see anything abnormal? And remember, she said she had right chest wall pain. Can you see any rib fractures there? Okay. Maybe, maybe around rib seven, you see some indentation there, looks a little bit funny, maybe. What about cardiac? Looks okay, nothing major. Aortic knob looks pretty much normal, doesn't look wide, okay? Anything else that you see here that looks abnormal to you? All right, so the reason I wanted to show you this because this is really something that I see a lot. You have elderly patients with a mechanical fall from standing, ground level fall, seems like minor trauma, but there's no such thing as minor trauma in the elderly population. Okay, you have to treat everything as a potential for major trauma. Particularly when they say, hey, 
it doesn't hurt that much, it's okay. They always minimize, okay? And so you may have very, very serious injuries with minimal physical exam findings, minimal complaints of pain. Now I put something in the history here that was a clue. The daughter said she doesn't normally complain about pain, but she wanted medicine. That should be an indicator to you that this patient actually is in much more severe pain than she is telling you, okay? If she doesn't normally ask and now she's asking, that's a clue that you should look harder, okay? A lot of doctors, they'll just get an x-ray and stop. But that's not enough. Here's why. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen an elderly patient who fell from standing with multiple broken ribs, hemothorax, pneumothorax, all kinds of bad stuff that you would never guess by looking at them. This is the difference between, let's say, a 30-year-old and a 90-year-old. The 30-year-old is going to be screaming, oh, it hurts, it hurts, I can't breathe, I can't, right? They're going to tell you that it's bad, but the elderly patient will not. So you have to have a higher index of suspicion for serious injuries from minor trauma. This patient had five broken ribs and a hemothorax, which we couldn't see at all here. So chest x-ray is really not a good test for falls and for trauma, particularly in the elderly, particularly this patient that has a blood thinner. Okay, I didn't show the abdomen, but there was nothing else on the abdomen. But you have to remember, if you have multiple rib fractures, you can have liver injuries, spleen injuries, all kinds of other things, renal injuries, that you have to have a high suspicion, because if you don't look for them, you won't find them. There was actually a study last year that compared x-ray versus CT, and it actually showed the majority of the time in an elderly patient with a chest, minor chest trauma, having the CT scan changed their management the majority of the time. So you had the right idea, you order the CT. You can get the x-ray just to say, okay, there's no major pneumothorax or something like that, that's more rapid, but you wanna get the CT scan, okay? You have to tr remember to treat the elderly more like a trauma patient, even from a minor trauma, okay? Because they're have more osteoporosis, they have less fat, they have less muscle, and they're gonna have much higher risk for serious injuries. We also did a CT of her head. She had a little tiny headache, remember, minor headache. She has a subdural. So this is, again, minimal complaints, minimal physical exam findings, very serious injuries, okay? So what are we gonna do with this patient who now has an intracranial hemorrhage, a hemothorax, and almost a flail chest. How do we manage this patient? So what's the first thing you wanna make sure you are doing with this patient on Coumadin with all of these injuries that are life-threatening? You would give them NSAIDs? on Coumadin with an intracranial hemorrhage and an intrathoracic hemorrhage. You want to do the opposite. You want to do the opposite. So what's the first thing that's going to kill this patient? What's our biggest life threat? Bleeding. And her INR is 2.4. So what do we need to do first? Reverse. We need to reverse her Coumadin. We need to reverse her INR. What are some ways that we can reverse the anticoagulation. How do we do that? There's a few choices, some are old, some are new. What's the old way to do it? That's, is that gonna work right away? How long does vitamin K take to actually have an effect on INR? Right, right. So that's not gonna help us. What's gonna help us right now? So there's two ways we can manage this, okay? The old fashioned way is FFP, fresh frozen plasma. That's the old way, but that's risky. You're giving blood products. You have to wait for the type and screen. That's not that fast and you can risk a reaction to the transfusion. Plus, let's say they have CHF or something. You're giving them volume 
sometimes a lot of volume, that can be dangerous. What's the new way to reverse anticoagulation? So what are some of those choices? What are the different options? Um, yeah, we can take uh, the right. right, right. So now there's different ones depending on which anticoagulation they take. If they're on warfarin, what's the choice? Okay. What about if they're on apixaban or one of the other novel anticoagulants? Sure. So maybe Jenny can help us out with these. So to summarize for the people at home, for this particular case, we would use the four-factor flag. P yeah, so PCC, right? And then also vitamin K. Now, what's our dose of vitamin K for this patient with life-threatening bleeding? Do you know? Do you know? Would we use oral or IV? Take a guess. IV. IV. And how much do we use? So there's actually a way that we have that we have recommendations based on INR of how much to use, depending on how high the INR would be. I'd say generally in any case of life-threatening bleeding, we go straight to 10 milligrams. There's different doses you can use if they're not having life-threatening bleeding, but there's some kind of bleeding you want to rapidly reverse. There's different doses, and I think you can probably share that later on, okay? So who are we going to call for a consultant about this patient? Who might we want to consult about this patient? What type? Tell me in Italian. Orthopedics? What are they going to do about her intracranial hemorrhage? What are they, what's an orthopedic surgeon going to do about intracranial hemorrhage? Neurosurgeon. So number one, neurosurgery. What's an orthopedic surgeon going to do about an intrathoracic hemorrhage? What is an orthopedic surgeon going to do for intrathoracic hemorrhage? Nothing. So you need to call a neurosurgeon and a trauma surgeon or a cardiothoracic surgeon, okay? Does this patient go home or stay in the hospital? This one's obvious. She stays in the hospital, probably in the intensive care unit. Okay?
And that's really useful to have someone physically there, especially in these acute cases where the faster you get this medication, it might really change the outcome rather than call the pharmacy, wait for the pharmacy to get to it, then wait for them to mix the medication, then wait for them to send the medication. That could be an hour. This is something that a, that a pharmacist in the emergency department can really help with. Exactly. Now, we don't always have them. I wish we did, but we don't. <laughs> All right. Question. Yes. Hi. In the kind of local resources settings, we are in Italy. Yep. Do you think at the moment people think of being given vaccinated if the protracted CDC is working in the shelf of finally it seems like that's very possible? Mm -hmm. It is expensive. Last case. This one's a little bit tricky, okay? So, grandma fell again. This time, she's 100. This time, she comes by ambulance. A neighbor heard a noise. She tried to knock on the door, no one answered. The neighbor got concerned and called an ambulance. In America, 911, here in Italy, 118. So the patient, the paramedics came, they found the patient, they had to break down the door. She lives alone, no one's there, she's confused. We don't know what her baseline is. Her house is a mess. There's garbage, there's urine. We don't know what's going on with this lady. Okay, but they found her on the floor. So she fell, that was what that noise was. We don't know anything about her otherwise. So, she says she has no family. She lives by herself. She has no idea why she fell. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know what medicines she takes. She says she feels kind of weak, but she doesn't have any pain. She has no idea if she hit her head. She says she hasn't been sick recently, but she doesn't really know. She says she doesn't really eat very much. And based on what the paramedics told you about her house, you, you believe that? There was nothing in the house to eat. She said she doesn't travel. She really can't tell you very much. Now, does this sound familiar? Yeah, we see this all the time. Undifferentiated, confused, fall in the elderly. So smart paramedics found some medications in her house and they put all the bottles in a bag and they brought them to the emergency department with the patient because they thought we might want to know what they were. So we don't know her history. If you ask her about, it, does she drink or use any drugs, she says maybe she has a little sip of brandy at night. Here's a medication list. Now, this medication list is different than the other two cases. Why is this different? What do you notice about this list? So this lady is 100 years old. She's on three antihypertensives. She's on memantadine, which tells us maybe she has some dementia or something like that. Mirtazapine, she doesn't eat. But she's on meclizine, lorazepam, oxybutynin, and trazodone. What do you think that these things will do to her mental status as a 100-year-old lady who lives by herself? Is this a good idea? No. Do we see this all the time? Yes. Okay. Polypharmacy, a big problem. And not all doctors or people who treat patients and prescribe medications are careful not to do this in elderly patients. So we have to check and see what they're taking that might be a problem. Okay. 
temperatures a tiny bit low, her heart rate's expectedly pretty low, her blood pressure's pretty good because she's on all that blood pressure medicine. We don't know if she's taking it, but she's supposed to. She knows her name and that's about it. She doesn't know what day it is, she doesn't know what year it is. You ask her what year is it, she says 1992. <laughs> Nothing on the head and neck exam that you can see that looks like a trauma. She's a little bit bradycardic, but that's it. And there's really nothing else on her physical exam. You can't find any signs of injuries. You press on every part of her body. Nothing really hurts. But she's a little confused. Sometimes you have to shake her a little bit to wake her up. But sometimes she's really agitated and she's trying to get out of bed. Does this sound familiar? So what are we doing for this lady? What's our differential diagnosis here? The answer is everything. This could be so many things. I mean, really, this could be a laundry list of things. So what are some of the top things we would think about for this patient? Mm -hmm. Also, she fell, right? We don't know if she hit her head. So CT head. What else? What kind of blood tests are we looking for? Blood count, okay. Okay. What else? Hmm? EKG, yep. Okay. What other causes of confusion and, and agitation might there be here? Polypharmacy, that's one thing. Yep. What else did she mention? That she maybe drinks a little? Don't forget that Older people drink and do drugs too, okay? It's not just young people. So maybe an alcohol level, toxicology. We see, what else? Let's see. So here's our, here's our electrolytes and our blood count. Ethanol level was 73. So she's definitely intoxicated, okay? Sodium's 128. Hyponatremia is a common cause in the elderly of confusion and falls. Why might she have hyponatremia? There's a few reasons. She doesn't eat, she doesn't take care of herself, and she drinks. Her potassium's low, her creatinine's high, her BUN is high. And here's that urinalysis we talked about. Remember this? Small leukocyte esterase, six to 10 white blood cells, one plus squamous, is that a UTI? Would you treat that? Raise your hand if you would give this patient antibiotics. Raise your hand if you would just send a culture and no antibiotics. That should be everybody, no antibiotics, okay? This is not a UTI. This does not explain the patient's mental status. So I would send that for a culture but I would not treat this right away, okay? Here's her head CT, nothing. Chest x-ray, she fell, nothing. Oh, she had a hip replacement, nothing else. So what are we gonna do with this patient? She has no family. She's confused. We don't really know why she fell, other than she drinks a little bit, maybe, and her sodium is a little bit low. Can she go home? No. What if she's agitated and she says, no, no, I, I need to go home. I'm not staying here. What do you do? This is an ethical problem. This is an ethical case, okay? That's why this one's a little bit tricky. There's nothing slam dunk medically wrong with her. You know, she's not 
critically hyponatremic. She doesn't have intracranial hemorrhage. She doesn't have any infections. But she also can't be sent home. Okay? So sometimes with the elderly, especially in the cases where they can't care for themselves, they don't feed themselves, they have no one to help them, sometimes we have to admit them to the hospital for social reasons and to get them help and a new living situation, okay? What's one way that's, if you're kind of on the fence about whether or not a patient can go home, what's something you should always do in the emergency department before you send a patient home? That's one, but, but even, not even doing that, what's something you really do in the department before you send this patient home? What do you have to do? You're not calling anybody. Yeah. Something you're doing with the patient. Forget about calls. This is important. How does how does a patient how does a pa how, make sure she's able to walk? How does a patient take care of themselves at home? They have to be able to walk. If they don't walk into the department and you want them to go home, make sure they can walk out. I have a rule, if you can't walk out, you can't go home, okay? So it's really important, even if you don't find anything wrong, let's say she was oriented and she fell and she, all of her labs were normal and everything was normal and she wanted to go home, but she was feeling a little bit weak. You still have to make sure she can walk, even if everything's normal, because sometimes that'll be like at the last minute you said, okay, let's discharge the patient home, the nurse goes to help the patient out, she can't stand up. How often does that happen? So make sure you check before you decide to discharge the patient that they can walk, okay? That's an important point. So we talked about this already. So back to the beginning, we talked about all of these things with these cases. Different history, polypharmacy, cognitive changes. If a patient has underlying dementia, we have to be really careful physiologic changes, social needs, atypical presentations, our lady with all the trauma barely had pain, right? Atypical exam findings, very little on physical exam that indicated the degree of trauma. Confounding factors, so we have to be extra careful with the questions we ask, extra careful with our physical exam, make sure they're comfortable, and we have to consider, we have to sometimes order more advanced tests for these patients compared to a regular younger patient. And finally, disposition. They have to be able to walk and they have to have a safe place to go. Okay? Questions? So I would not, but what I would do is this patient will be staying in the hospital. And when I talk to the admitting doctor in internal medicine, I would mention, you know, this patient is on all of these drugs. I think we need to really review these medications and make sure you know about it before they go home. So in, our, in America, I am the only doctor on the team. I work alone. There's no other doctors in the emergency department. Nobody else works in the emergency department but the emergency physician. And so the only time you would do that is if the patient is being admitted to internal medicine or whoever else. So they would be the ones who would do the discharge planning. And so that's why that would be a decision for them. So whatever I do generally will disappear once the patient leaves my department. And I can't make sure that that stays that way. And so I will communicate with the team that's taking care of her in the hospital to make sure that that gets done while they're in the hospital before they're discharged. From the department itself, if we look back at the medications that she takes, I'm not going to be giving any of these medications right now. So for now, we're giving nothing, okay? Because we don't even know if she's taking these, and probably she's not. So this is really something for discharge planning. And so it, I know it's a little bit different here, but for us, that would be something that the internal medicine doctor would do upstairs. Right. 
And so that's why it'll be something that you decide while she's in the hospital over the next few days in terms of what you actually want to send her home with. Does she need all that blood pressure medicine? Does she need all those other medications? And that's something that time will tell. Any other questions? Home questions? Okay, that's it. Thank you for listening. I would like to expect some comments about the connection between doctors and the pharmacist. Uh, as you can, uh, can see reviewing uh, these lectures, all doctors are always related to problems or drugs or pharmacies or uh, other uh, situations. So it is important to know very well pharmacology I think, and if you are not able to remember all, probably it is necessary to ask for help from a pharmacist. Are you connected in, uh, in your department, uh, Lexi, with the pharmacist? I am, but they're not physically in the department, like Jenny would be, they're in the pharmacy, but I can call them. Okay, thank you. In English. In English. In English. So I'm Giovanni, I'm one of the emergency medicine residents in Pavia. And so and we also try to do a lot of experiences abroad. We like to engage other university. And so me and other my colleagues have been all over the world basically. So I just came back from South Africa and I have my colleagues Bruno that uh, is just now finishing his period in uh, uh, a toxicology intensive care unit in Paris and so this is also one of the beauty of medicine and emergency medicine because we have the chance to see how the different healthcare system in the world work and that's how also we met Lexi in other uh, international events and so I don't know if you guys are from pharmacy or medicine if you're medical students medical residents pharmacia so, and also work a lot with pharmacists, as we said, and a specific branch of medicine is toxicology that now is developing outside pharmacy. And also with emergency room, we work a lot with them. And as residents go to work in the poison control centers, in Centro Antivileni. Do you know Centro Antivileni? And there are the poison control center themselves that also push us doctors to work a lot with them and to exchange information. And there are some poison control centers that uh, um, actually they send their toxicologists in person in the ER. This is happening in Iguardo Hospital in Milan where you have the poison control center above the ER. So sometimes the pharmacist or the clinical toxicologist go and see the patient by himself or herself. So it's uh, so precious to be able to rely on such a knowledge resources that they have. And we're so happy with this cooperation. Yes, I'm a... Oh.
The problem is that in Italy, we are um, always used to see the pharmacist uh, only a person involved uh, in uh, formulation, uh, drug delivery, and so on. But th this is not uh, true also in Italy, because we have some uh, little experiences in some hospitals uh, like Turin, like uh, Palermo, like uh, Padua, stop yes uh, where uh, the pharmacist is working uh, in uh, emergency department first and also and uh, in oncology in Turin, in all departments uh, two pharmacists are working together with the doctor because uh, what uh, i am trying to stress uh, is uh, the, the new aspects of the pharmacist work this is a clinical pharmacy we will discuss with jenny from tomorrow about this topic and this is important for the student of pharmacy but also for students in medicine and also for doctors and residents they are not used to think this ability this use to work together and discuss topics, uh, case, uh, cases, uh, uh, drug use, uh, recovery with the pharmacist. Normally doctors uh, are used to do what they want, but uh, as uh, Giovanni told, they are used to ask for help to uh, Centroveleni, to, what is it in English? Poison control. Poison control center. Okay. Uh, and this is very useful. We are uh, very lucky because uh, Pavia is the most important uh, center in Italy, is the coordinator of all centers in Italy at this moment. And uh, when I was the director of, uh, uh, a founder and director of the uh, school, uh, speciality school in emergency medicine, I send my residents to this center and uh, this was very useful and interesting we was the first school uh, using uh, this uh, center now probably all uh, schools uh, are used to send residents to their um, centers or um, to the center of pavia 
But it's very important in this uh, uh, aspect and uh, is able to stress, uh, is used to stress uh, the importance uh, uh, to, to have attention to the drugs, to the drugs, yes. In hospital, uh, sometimes it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, common to, to think always uh, the role and the uh, action, the pharmacodynamics uh, of drugs. And this is very important as we saw uh, in these cases uh, and in the presentation of Jenny at this moment. I would like you can review this presentation because it's very important to review, understand and meditate all, all information we was able to, to obtain from these lectures. <clears throat> important for me also is a, a message that when you are um, uh, in contact with a patient, uh, you have to ask for a lot of information, not only what uh, he is feeling in this moment, but also the history, medication, and uh, exams. The last case uh, is very important. Hyponatremia is uh, a, a very common in uh, older patients. I saw many older patients without an exam for several years. So it is impossible that uh, um, to don't do exams uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in olders. And probably in emergency department, uh, you are used to see many situations like this uh, with uh, alteration of exams not made in the past at this moment. Also using drugs, as Jenny told us about the difference, for example, GABA, the pregabalin, and uh, which is the most important to use, <laughs> please. <laughs> yes, it is important. But uh, this is very important to know because in personalized medicine, it's important to know the situation, the health situation of the patient to use the more appropriate drug at this, in this moment. Related, for example, in geriatric patients about the uh, function of liver, of uh, kidney, of heart, of lung, and so on. And also blood pressure, as uh, we saw in some cases, low blood pressure in older patients is uh, very dangerous. It's not possible. We have, uh, as we discussed the, during the lectures, uh, we have a uh, new guidelines related to the um, definition of hypertension or good uh, level of blood pressure in older patients. This is very different from young. Do you have comments? Teachers? No, okay. So uh, now we can uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jenny and uh, Lexi. I am very, very happy. I, we had uh, uh, more than hundreds uh, uh, people uh, online uh, because uh, students uh, are around uh, um, for um, around the city, town, uh, or region for uh, other problems. Some uh, students uh, from uh, Erasmus uh, town, so they are uh, abroad at this moment. And uh, this is very important because the message uh, to the students of pharmacy is uh, uh, arrived to their mind at this moment. I hope that this, this will be very interesting also for, um, for students of medicine. And uh, I hope to be able to collaborate with Giovanni. Giovanni is very uh, clever and also hard young residents, very, very important. Uh, he went also to South Africa 
working uh, with helicopter and so on uh, around uh, Africa and so on. Quindi, so, so, very, are a very young, uh, um, very, very active at this moment. Okay, we will discuss tomorrow. Two, we have two lot, two lectures tomorrow. One at three o'clock, another at five o'clock, and, and we we will uh, enter in the clinical pharmacy in what a pharmacist in the hospital is uh, is uh, uh, doing during the day. Yes, this is the title of your uh, lecture at this moment. And also what is important to know about clinical, clinical aspects of the patients for, for a pharmacist. Thank you very much. We will see uh, tomorrow for the lecture and for the people for the lunch, we will go to the Moderno restaurant for eight o'clock p.m. Thank you very much. Bye. The development of the new national health service requires commitment and training. Knowledge and organization must be adapted to the needs and modernized. Scientific and technological development from advances in molecular or imaging diagnostics to the rapid development of new drugs, instrumentation and methods from the perspectives of regenerative medicine to the spread of wearable monitoring tools. Designs medicine in continuous evolution with the patient at the center who is increasingly involved in his own personalized healthcare process. As a result, the health organization is also evolving toward new models of care, integrating the different specialist skills and services with respect to the clinical conditions of the acute and chronic phases of the disease in an aging population that presents increasingly complex problems. We are therefore faced with new types of therapeutic strategies and with an organizational evolution, both nationally and regionally, that needs to evolve the model of clinical pharmacy currently applied in our NHS. The clinical pharmacy was born from the need to customize the therapy and the approach oriented to the individual patient and his needs. Now is the time to rethink and modernize this approach, providing a more marked involvement in the clinical part to get fully into the new model of care as competent and organized specialists. The clinical pharmacy can develop into a new model of care if it offers professionals and prepared, both from a technical and managerial point of view. We will have the excellent opportunity to hear from the protagonists at the forefront of this new service for Italy, which is the collaboration doctors and clinical pharmacists. From USA, Chicago and Harvard, Lexi Osro and Jenny Cowell will talk about seniors in ED and collaboration in clinical pharmacy.